So can you talk to me about manual hyperinflation? How is it done? Um, what's the clinical practice around it? Um, and is there anything particular of consideration if you were using manual hyperinflation to clear um, a PDOC patient's chest? Yeah, we tend to be quite careful. It's the one thing that we're more careful with of all our treatments is manual hyperinflation or bagging, as we mm. call it, um, because of things like affecting the intracranial pressure. So if it's a very early P uh, PDOC patient or somebody who you're not sure what their outcome is going to be, we tend to be very cautious with manual hyperinflation. Um, and it's one of the things we probably wouldn't do early on, just because you don't want to increase swelling in the brain at that stage. Once the patient's out of that sort of risk of secondary swelling, then we tend to be more aggressive, and that also tends to coincide with the point the patient is getting a, a bad chest infection. So essentially with a bag is we just disconnect the patient from the ventilator, attach them to the bag, and you can mimic deep breaths that the patient would take if they were fit and well. So one of us will be doing the suction and the shaking and the other one will be giving the patient deep breaths. Tends to be the sort of, we tend to set it at a pressure of about 40 centimetres of water. But if we're unsure of sort of the patient's pressures and things in terms of their head, then we might drop the pressures. If we want to keep their CO2 down a little bit, we may give um, less big breaths and faster. quicker. So we give faster breaths just to keep the CO2 down a little bit. It's not... The research about doing that is a little bit sketchy, but it tends to just be a very temporary thing that you do quickly, just in such that when we used to have the heads here where we had ICP monitoring, we could see ICP was rising, give a few fast little breaths, you bring the ICP back down enough that you could do a suction, clear the chest, and, and, and okay, yeah. Yeah, it would, that would help the patient. Now we don't have the ICP monitors, we just sort of have to use clinical intuition and a bit of common sense more, really. Um, but that essentially is bagging in a nutshell. Once you've done your suction, you tend to give a couple of deep breaths just to reinflate the bases of the lungs and reattach them to the ventilator. We use CO2 monitoring as a way of being able to tell. So uh, we know that any intervention that we do as therapists with help someone that's got an acute head is going to make their head worse. But at one point, if their CO2 starts to rise, and their CO2, at, because of they've got sputum retention, then that rising CO2 is going to damage their head. So at that point, so even if someone's quite productive, we may not get involved at all as long as their CO2 doesn't start to rise. But once their CO2 starts to rise, then unless we clear their chest, the CO2 is going to kill, affect, negatively affect their head anyway. So at that point, we can justify our interventions. It's quite a nice objective it. measure that we use. We, we, I've all, I've, I was taught it when I was in London and I've, we've just carried on and it seemed, it makes sense. I can justify what I'm going to do to because of that. And then we can modify using the bag, we can modify how we do our treatments because of the fact that we can, we know what's going to happen to their heads and the ice and the swelling and things. So we can, it's, it's much more flexible than allows you to do that. Um, and once they're off the ventilator, then we'll just nice deep breaths, quick release. So basically what you're getting is a deep breath in and a huff. So it helps to move the secretions from the small airways into the large airways. So it's easier for as you're shaking them to then be able to clear their chest. So that's how we've managed them. There are other, uh, but you now, as I said, the cough assist is in now. So a lot of people will use that for the non-ventilated patients. Some people are using it for the ventilated patients, putting it in circuit and getting a huff that way. We've always used a bag and are quite happy with the way we're doing it. The nurses all know how to do it. Um, as I say, it costs a pound to have a bag. Uh, everyone's bed space so um, it's something we, we teach them the contraindications we teach them when we use it we tend to be the ones that use it with the nurses so the nurses sometimes will bag while we'll shake so, and they're happy with doing that and we teach them also it's what we've always stayed with and it's gone in and out of fashion <laughs> it kind of went out of fashion there's some evidence now coming out that it's coming back into vogue again um, and the, to me a cough assist is basically doing the same thing um, you said something about things that you can feel through the bag. Mm. Um, can you explain that a bit more? It rumbles. So as you bag, you can feel someone's compliance. So if once you're used to using a bag a lot of times, so you can feel if a chest is tight, you can feel if it's, if it's wheezy, you can hear if it's wheezy, you can hear if there's any lower secretions or higher secretions, they'll sound differently depending on the bag. Um, and you can tell how effective you are. So if, you, if, you're, if your pressure is on 40 and you're bagging them and the patient and someone's shaking them, then you suction their chest, when you go to bag them again on that same, with the valve at that same pressure, suddenly you're not getting anywhere near the pressure because you've reduced the resistance 
resistance there is within their chest. So suddenly that you can tell that you've cleared their chest. So not only does it sound better, but actually the compliance is better as well. So you can get that feedback from, from using your bag. So if you've used the bag a lot, it gives you, you get an immense amount of feedback rather than just a, a big breath and a, a cough, basically. Amazing.